When was the euro introduced? The euro, the currency of the 12 European Union nations Belgium, Germany, Greece, Spain. France, Ireland, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Austria, Portugal. And Finland went into circulation January 1, 2002, becoming part of daily life for more than 300 million people. The banknotes and coins replaced national currencies, making the franc. Deutsche Mark, Peseta and Lira, among others, history in the participating nations. The euro's origins can be traced to a series of international agreements. Beginning in 1978, which were made among the members of what was then called the European Community, or EC. In February 1986 the framework for the unified monetary system was agreed upon by nations who signed the single European Act, creating an area without internal frontiers, in which the free movement of goods, persons, services and capital is ensured. The 1989 Dellers report outlined a plan to introduce the currency in three phases. The final phase of that plan began on January 1, 1999, when the 11 countries later to become 12, belonging to the European Union established the conversion rates between their respective national currencies and the euro, creating a monetary union with a single currency. A three-year transition phase followed during which monetary transactions could be made in euro, but there was no requirement to do so. On January 1, 2002, the central banks of the 12 participating countries put into circulation about 7.8 billion euro notes and 40.4 billion euro coins, together worth 144 billion euros. Simultaneously each country began to withdraw its own currency from circulation. By February 28, 2002, the changeover was complete. Meaning the national currencies were completely withdrawn and only the euro was in circulation. When 10 new nations, Cyprus, Czech Republic, Estonia, Hungary, Latvia, Lithuania, Malta, Poland, Slovakia, and Slovenia, joined the EU on May 1, 2004, there was no timetable for their adoption of the euro. Previously, in 2003, Sweden voted against joining the euro area. When were ATMs introduced? The ubiquitous automatic teller machine, ATM, was introduced in 1967 by Britain's Barclays Bank at a branch near London. Two years later, the chemical bank opened the first ATM in the United States. At Rockville Center, New York. Self-service banking grew steadily in the 1980s and took off in the 1990s. When some banks began charging their customers for banking through tellers rather than ATMs. What was triangular trade? 
Triangular trade refers to the various navigation routes that emerged during the colonial period. There were numerous triangular paths that ships traveled. Ferrying P.E.O.P.L.E. goods, both raw and finished, and livestock. The most common triangular route began on Africa's west coast where ships picked up slaves. The second stop was the Caribbean islands predominantly the British and French West Indies where the slaves were sold to plantation owners. And traders used the profits to purchase sugar, molasses, tobacco, and coffee. These raw materials were then transported north to the third stop. New England, where a rum industry was thriving. Their ships were loaded with the spirits and traders made the last leg of their journey back across the Atlantic to Africa's west coast, where the process began again. Other trade routes operated as follows, 1. Manufactured goods were transported from Europe to the African coast. Slaves to the West Indies, and sugar, tobacco, and coffee transported back to Europe. Where the triangle began again, two, lumber, cotton, and meat were transported from the colonies to southern Europe. Wine and fruits to England, and manufactured goods to the colonies, where the triangle began again. There were as many possible routes as there were ports and demand for goods. The tragic result of triangular trade was the transport of an estimated 10 million black Africans. Sold into slavery, these human beings were often chained below deck and allowed only brief if any. Periods of exercise during the transatlantic crossing, which came to be called the Middle Passage. Conditions for the slaves were brutal and improved only slightly when traders realized that should slaves perish during the long journey across the ocean, it would adversely affect their profits upon arrival in the West Indies. After economies in the islands of the Caribbean crashed at the end of the 1600s, many slaves were sold to plantation owners on the North American mainland, initiating another tragic trade route. The slave trade was abolished in the 1800s. Putting an end to the capture of Africans and their forced migration to the Western Hemisphere. What was the Comstock load? The richest silver mine in the United States, the Comstock load was also plentiful in gold. The ore deposit was found in 1857 at Mount Davidson in western Nevada. About 16 miles southeast of Reno. The discoverers, Ethan Allen Grosch and Hosea Ballou Grosch, died before they could record the claim. American prospector Henry T. P. Comstock, 1820-1870, laid claim to the load in 1859, but later sold it for an insignificant amount compared to what it was worth. The mine flourished until 1865 and again between 1873 and 1882, when the Big Bonanza, a super-rich ore vein, yielded more than $100 million. By 1882 the mine had yielded $397 million in ore and had produced half the United States silver output during the period. Western Nevada had become a hotbed of mining activity, attracting numerous prospectors. <laughs> 
among those who made their fortune from the Comstock load was American mining magnate and future Senator George Hearst, 1820-1891. He used his fortune to buy the San Francisco Examiner in 1880, which was taken over by his son. American newspaper publisher William Randolph Hearst, 1863-1951, seven years later. Virginia City, established in 1859 at the site of the discovery. Became one of the West's boomtowns during the late 1800s. By 1898 the mines at the Comstock Lode were all but abandoned. Wasteful mining methods and the demonetization of silver brought its demise. What was Y2K? Y2K means year 2000, K is a metric abbreviation for thousand. In the late 1990s the term was most often coupled with problem or bug to refer to a potentially disastrous computer programming peculiarity. Over decades of programming and in trillions of lines of code. Developers had truncated the four-digit year to two digits as a space-saving mechanism. So that 1999 was rendered as 99. It was therefore feared that many computer programs, as well as simple chips in VCRs, watches, and other consumer devices, might malfunction, reading 00 not as 2000 but as 1900, or not recognize it at all. The problem was a concern for every sector of the global economy, but it was feared to have a particularly ruinous impact on the mainframe computer systems that are the backbone of operations for banks and other financial institutions. Electric utilities, water systems, communication systems, oil and gas companies and government entities, such as the Department of Defense and the Social Security Administration. In the second half of the 1990s, business and government developed solutions to the Y2K problem. Or the millennial bug, readiness was gauged periodically. To encourage the sharing of best practices across and between industries. The federal government passed the year 2000 Information and Readiness Disclosure Act, signed October 1998. Despite assurances that the Y2K bug had been fixed. Much of the public met the year 2000 with at least a bit of trepidation, some people having made emergency preparations. Such as stocking up on food and water, buying generators, and stashing away cash. Though there were isolated glitches, no major problem surfaced. Thanks to rectification efforts, the foretold Y2K crisis never materialized. But the cost of fixing the problem was high, it had an estimated $1.5 trillion price tag. What is solidarity? It was a worker-led movement for political reform in Poland. During the 1980s and it led to the downfall of communism. The movement was inspired by Pope John Paul II's June 1979 visit to his native Poland, where in Warsaw, he delivered a speech to millions, calling for a free Poland and a new kind of solidarity. 
as scholar and author Timothy Garden Ash noted, without the Pope. No solidarity. Without solidarity, no Gorbachev. Without Gorbachev, no fall of communism. Shipyard electrician Lech Walesa, 1943, became the leader of Solidarity. Formed in 1980 when 50 labor unions banded together to protest Poland's communist government. The union staged strikes and demonstrations. By 1981 Solidarity had gained so many followers that it threatened Poland's government which responded, with the support of the Soviet Union, by instituting martial law in December of that year. The military cracked down on the activities of the unions. Abolishing Solidarity in 1982 and arresting its leaders, including the charismatic Walensa. But the powerful People's Movement, which had also swept up farmers who formed the Rural Solidarity, could not be suppressed. Martial law was lifted in mid-1983 but the government continued to exert control over the people's freedom. That year Walensa received the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts to gain workers' rights and prevent violence. Solidarity continued its work for reform. In 1989 the collapse of communism on the horizon, people's movements in Eastern Europe had combined with Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev's policy of glasnost to herald the system's demise. The Polish government reopened negotiations with Solidarity's leadership. Free elections were held that year, with the Labour Party candidates gaining numerous seats in Parliament. In 1990 Walensa was elected president, at which time he resigned as chairman of Solidarity. Poland's Communist Party was dissolved that year. What is black gold? Black gold is a term for oil or petroleum black because of its appearance when it comes out of the ground. And gold because it made prospectors, drillers, and oil industry men rich. The oil industry in the United States began in 1859 when retired railroad conductor Edwin L. Drake, 1819-1880, drilled a well near Titusville, Pennsylvania. His drill, powered by an old steam engine, struck oil. Oil from animal tallow and whales, had been used as a lubricant since colonial times. The discovery of a process for deriving kerosene, a clean burning and easy lighting fuel. From coal oil had been patented in 1854. After Drake's Titusville well produced shale oil. The substance was analyzed for its properties and it, too, was determined to be an excellent source of kerosene. Soon others began prospecting for rock oil. Western Pennsylvania became an important oil producing region. Wagons and river barges transported barrels to market, later, the railroad reached into the region. And by 1875 a pipeline was built to carry the oil directly to Pittsburgh. Petroleum products soon replaced whale oil as a fluid for illumination. During the 1880s, Ohio, Kentucky, Illinois and Indiana also produced oil. In 
In 1901 the famous spindle top field in eastern Texas produced. The nation's first gusher oil literally sprang out of the earth. During the next decade, California and Oklahoma joined Texas to lead the nation's oil production. Between 1859 and 1900, U.S. oil production boomed, just 2,000 barrels were produced the year it was discovered in Pennsylvania. More than 64 million barrels were produced annually by the turn of the century. The second half of the 1800s saw the oil industry boom, the fuel was used for lighting, heating, and lubrication, principally of machinery and tools. But the advent of the automobile and its central role in the life of 20th century America made the oil industry richer yet. Demand soon exceeded the nation's supply of petroleum, prompting the United States to increasingly rely on imported oil for fuel. Why was the completion of the Erie Canal important to you? S. Development Completed in 1825, the Erie Canal joined the Atlantic Ocean to the Great Lakes. Linking the east with the west and for the first time allowing freight and settlers to easily move back and forth between the regions. Begun on July 4, 1817, the canal was sponsored by Governor DeWitt Clinton. 1769-1828, of New York, who planned and eventually carried out the huge building project. The waterway was funded by the state of New York, which paid just over $7 million to complete it. The original canal was 363 miles long, 40 feet wide at the surface, and 4 feet deep. It had 83 locks, which raised vessels 562 feet between the Hudson River and Lake Erie. A lock is a section of a canal that can be closed to control the water level and is then used to either raise or lower a vessel to another body of water. Beginning at Albany, New York, on the Hudson River, which flows into the Atlantic Ocean at New York City. The canal extends west as far as Buffalo, New York, on Lake Erie, one of the five Great Lakes. The waterway, which was inaugurated by the run of the barge Seneca Chief on October 26, 1825, could transport passengers aboard boats and move cargo aboard barges, which were pulled by teams of horses and mules on the ground. In spite of the critics, who dubbed the ambitious project Clinton's Wonder and Clinton's Ditch, the canal's positive impact on the American economy was felt within the first decade of its operation. The new transportation route reduced freight rates both eastward and westward. Made Buffalo a major port in the region and New York City a major international port, was a catalyst for population growth. In upstate New York and throughout the Old Northwest, the present-day states of Ohio, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Wisconsin, and part of Minnesota, and prompted other states, Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois, to build canals, further opening up the country's interior to development and commerce. Since crops could be shipped from these lush farmlands and as more farms came into existence, The Erie Canal helped supply the newly arrived immigrants in the eastern cities with food. <laughs>
in turn, they ship manufactured goods west to the farming communities. The canal was enlarged several times between 1835 and 1862 to increase its capacity. In 1903 New York voted to link the canal with three shorter waterways in the state to form the New York State Barge Canal, which opened in 1918. What was the Night of Terror? It is a little-known episode in the American suffragist movement that took place on November 14, 1917, at the Occoquan Workhouse in Lorton, Virginia. After President Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924, took office in January 1917, activists began picketing daily outside the White House, demanding the right to vote for women. It was the first time in history that demonstrators had marched at the White House. The suffragists carried banners that read, Mr. What were the Freedom Rides? The Freedom Rides were a series of bus rides designed to test the U.S. Supreme Court's prohibition of segregation in interstate travel. In 1960, in the case of Boynton v. Virginia, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of a Howard University student who charged that segregation laws at the Richmond, Virginia, bus station violated federal anti-segregation laws. The Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, decided to test the enforcement of the federal law by initiating the Freedom Rides. On May 4, 1961, 13 people, black and white, boarded a bus for the South. Meant as a nonviolent means of protest against local segregation laws. The riders were nevertheless met with violence when the bus reached Montgomery, Alabama. On May 20, a white mob was waiting, the Freedom Riders were beaten. Rioting broke out in the city, and U.S. Marshals were sent to restore order. The interracial campaign to desegregate transportation was ultimately successful. But government intervention was required to enforce the laws. As numerous Southern whites had demonstrated that they weren't going to comply voluntarily. What were the navigation acts? Between 1645 and 1761 British Parliament passed a series of 29 laws intended to tightly control colonial trade, shipping, and industry to the benefit of English interests in America. These acts, which were largely ignored by the American colonists, were intended to ensure that the British colonies in North America remained subservient to the mother country. The initial act of 1645 forbade the import of whale oil into England. Unless it was transported aboard English ships with English crews. Subsequent laws, those passed in 1651, 1660, and 1663, 
provided the basis of the Navigation Acts. The first Navigation Act, 1651, resembled the legislation of 1645, but was more far-reaching. It stipulated that goods could only enter England, Ireland, or the colonies aboard English, or English colonial, ships. Further, colonial coastal trade was to be conducted entirely aboard English ships. The Second Navigation Act, 1660, reaffirmed that goods could only be transported aboard English ships and established a list of enumerated articles that had to be shipped directly to England. The intent was to prevent the colonies from trading directly with any other European country. England required the colonies to sell their materials to English merchants or pay duties on goods sold to other countries. The list of articles included sugar, cotton, tobacco, indigo, rice, molasses, apples, and wool. In 1663 Parliament passed the Staple Act, making it illegal for colonies to buy products directly from foreign countries. European countries would first need to ship their products to England or pay customs fees. Through the Navigation Acts England tried to establish itself as the gatekeeper of colonial imports and exports. But the laws were difficult to enforce, and the colonists easily circumvented them. Smuggling was rampant. Still, the laws, which continued to be passed until the eve of the American Revolution, 1775-83, had little effect on the colonial economy, which grew at twice the rate of England's during the period. What was the nonviolence movement? The Rev. Martin Luther King Jr. 1929-1968, was committed to bringing about change by staging peaceful protests. He led a campaign of nonviolence as part of the civil rights movement. King rose to prominence as a leader during the Montgomery bus boycott in 1955, when he delivered a speech that embodied his Christian beliefs and set the tone for the nonviolence movement, saying, We are not here advocating violence. The only weapon we have, is the weapon of protest. Throughout his life, King staunchly adhered to these beliefs even after terrorists bombed his family's home. King's arsenal of democratic protest included boycotts, marches. The words of his stirring speeches, comprising an impressive body of oratory, and sightings. With other African American ministers King established the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. 1957, which assumed a leadership role during the Civil Rights Movement. The nonviolent protest of black Americans proved a powerful weapon against segregation and discrimination. A massive demonstration in Birmingham, Alabama. In 1963 helped sway pubic opinion and motivate lawmakers in Washington to act when news coverage of the event showed peaceful protesters being subdued by policemen using dogs and heavy fire hoses. In response to the outcry over the event in Birmingham, President John F. Kennedy, 
1917-1963, proposed civil rights legislation to Congress. The bill was passed in 1964. That same year Martin Luther King Jr received the Nobel Peace Prize for his nonviolent activism. King's policy of peace was challenged two years later when the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee SNCC, tired of the violent response with which peaceful protesters were often met, urged activists to adopt a more decisive and aggressive stance and began promoting the slogan Black Power. The civil rights movement, having made critical strides, became fragmented, as leaders. Including the highly influential Malcolm X, 1925-1965, differed over how to effect change. On April 4, 1968, King was in Memphis, Tennessee, to show his support for a strike of black. Sanitation workers when he was gunned down outside his hotel room shortly after 5.30 in the evening. As news of King's death swept over the nation, blacks in 168 American cities and towns responded with rioting. Setting fire to buildings, and looting white businesses. Commenting on the terror, Radical African-American leader Stokely Carmichael said. When white America killed Dr. King last night, she declared war on us. The chaos continued for a week, when the rioting ended on April 11, there were 46 dead. Most of them black, 35,000 injured and 20,000 jailed. Nevertheless, the violent crime that claimed the leader's life and the violence that erupted after news spread of his death have not, decades later, overshadowed King's legacy of peace and his message of the brotherhood of all people. What was Enron? Enron was a high-flying energy trading and communications company headquartered in Houston, Texas. It was the seventh largest corporation in the United States, a favorite on Wall Street. And for six years in a row, 1996 to 2001, was named America's most innovative company by Fortune magazine. Then Enron filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in December 2001. Rocking the business world and shocking investors and rank and file employees. It was, for a short time, the largest bankruptcy in American history. Federal investigators later learned that the company's collapse was caused by fraudulent accounting. Practices that allowed Enron to overstate earnings and hide debts. The conglomerate had booked billions in profits that did not really exist and created mythical companies to bury heavy losses. Enron's stock price plummeted, there were massive layoffs, employee retirement accounts. Heavily invested in Enron stock, were decimated, executives resigned, and criminal indictments followed. Its accounting firm, Chicago-based Arthur Anderson, collapsed under the weight of its involvement in the scandal. Enron soon became emblematic of a much larger problem, the so-called breakdown of corporate America. It was the first of several colossal business failures. The biggest of which was the collapse of telecom giant WorldCom. In 
in July 2002 WorldCom, valued at $180 billion and serving 15 million customers at its 1999 peak, filed for bankruptcy. WorldCom eclipsed Enron to earn the dubious title of largest bankruptcy in U.S. history. Again. Fraudulent business practices were to blame. In March 2005 a federal jury convicted former WorldCom Inc. CEO Bernard Ebers of engineering $11 billion in fraud. He was also found guilty of conspiracy and of filing false financial reports. The conviction was critical to prosecutors in a host of pending cases connected to corporate scandals. Including Enron, whose former chairman, Kenneth Lay, and former CEO, Tom Skilling, were awaiting trial, set for 2006. A Fortune magazine writer reflected on the crisis of corporate ethics, saying, phony earnings, inflated revenues. Conflicted Wall Street analysts, directors asleep at the switch this isn't just a few bad. Apples, it is a systemic breakdown. Enron happened to be first, and it became the symbol for the many. In 2005 Enron was in the process of distributing remaining assets to creditors and liquidating other operations. WorldCom, meanwhile, emerged from bankruptcy in 2004 as MCI Inc. The name of one of its subsidiaries. What was the temperance movement? Temperance was an American movement that began in the mid-1800s to outlaw the manufacture and consumption of alcoholic beverages, which were viewed by many to be a corrupt influence on American family life. By 1855 growing public support to ban liquor resulted in 31 states making it illegal to some degree. But a national policy of temperance was still sought by many. During the 1870s temperance became one of the cornerstones of the growing women's movement. As the nation's women, joined by other activists, mobilized to gain suffrage. The right to vote, they also espoused sweeping cultural changes. In 1874 a group of women established the Women's Christian Temperance Union. WCTU, in 1895 the Anti-Saloon League was formed. Such societies, which grew out of a fundamentalist spirit, found an increasing voice and eventually influenced legislators, many of whom were dry candidates that the societies had supported, to take federal action. Even President Woodrow Wilson, 1856-1924, supported prohibition. As one of the domestic policies of his new freedom program. The movement met with success in January 16, 1919, when the 18th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. 1788, was ratified forbidding people to make, sell, or transport intoxicating liquors in the United States and in all territories within its jurisdiction. Though Congress, which proposed the amendment on December 18, 1917, provided states with a period of seven years in which to ratify the amendment.
it took just over a year for it to be approved, such was the prevailing spirit among lawmakers. After the amendment was made, Congress passed the Volstead Act to enforce it. But government nevertheless found prohibition difficult to enforce. Bootleggers, who made their own moonshine illegal spirits, often distilled at night. Rum runners, who imported liquor, principally from neighboring Canada and Mexico. And speakeasies, underground establishments that sold liquor to their clientele, proliferated. Soon organized crime ran the distribution of liquor in the country. Whose citizens had not lost their taste for alcoholic beverages. The government now found itself with a bigger problem. As the Federal Bureau of Investigation, FBI, and police worked to control and end mob violence. And as the country suffered through the early years of the Great Depression, lawmakers in Washington reconsidered. The Amendment On February 20, 1933, the U.S. Congress proposed that the 18th Amendment be repealed. Approved by the states in December of that year, the 21st Amendment declared the 18th Amendment null. And the manufacture, transportation, and consumption of alcoholic beverages was again legal in the United States, ending the 13-year period of prohibition. Herbert Hoover, 1874-1964, president at the time of repeal, called prohibition a noble experiment. Backslash who was Carrie Nation? The Kentucky-born Cary Nation, 1846-1911, became famous as a temperance agitator in the early 1900s. The saloon was illegal in her resident state of Kansas. And she felt it was her divine duty to take her hatchet to ruining any place that sold intoxicants. Between 1899 and 1909, she went on wrecking expeditions, which she called hatchetations. Throughout the state, incurring the wrath of business owners and government officials. Though many might have favored national prohibition of alcohol. Nation's actions were extreme to say the least, causing her to be arrested, imprisoned 30 times, and even shot at. She persisted, however, buoyed by the belief that she was performing a public and even divine service. The propitiously named Carry A Nation, who tried, it seems, to carry the nation straight to the water fountain, did not live to see prohibition made into a national policy in 1917 nor to see it revoked in 1933. Who was Baiko? Stephen Baiko, 1946-1977 Was a black leader in the fight against South African apartheid and white minority rule. In 1969 Baiko, who was then a medical student, founded the South African Students' Organization, which took an active role in the black consciousness movement, a powerful force in the fight against apartheid. Preaching a doctrine of black self-reliance and self-respect. Baiko organized protests, including anti-government strikes and marches. <laughs> 
viewing such activities as a challenge to its authority and fearing an escalation of unrest. In August 1977, the white government had Baiko arrested. Within one month, he died in prison. Evidence indicated he had died at the hands of his jailers. A revelation that only cemented anti-government sentiment. Along with Nelson Mandela, 1918, who was imprisoned in South Africa from 1962 to 1990 for his political activities, Baiko became a symbol of the anti-apartheid movement. Galvanizing support for racial justice at home and abroad. Why was the invention of barbed wire important to Western development? Barbed wire was commercially developed in 1874 by American inventor Joseph Glidden, 1813-1906. Consisting of steel wires that are twisted together to make sharp points resembling thorns. The material was quickly implemented in the West to construct fences. With trees scarce on the Great Plains, farmers had lacked the materials to erect wooden fences. Instead they resorted to planting prickly shrubs as a way of defining their lands and confining livestock. However, this method was not always effective. With the advent of barbed wire, farmers were able to fence in their acreage. Cattle owners became angered by small farmers who put up barbed wire. They had previously allowed livestock to roam the open plain. Fearing depletion of grazing lands, ranchers also began using barbed wire to fence tracts. Whether or not they could claim legal title to them. Disputes arose between ranchers and between ranchers and farmers. In 1885, President Grover Cleveland, 1837 to 1908, brought an end to illegal fencing, ordering officials to remove barbed wire from public lands and Indian reservations. Legal use of the material to define land claim boundaries brought the demise of the open range and helped speed agricultural development of the prairie. President, how long must women wait for liberty? And, more radically, Kaiser Wilson, 20 million American women are not self-governed. Their intent was to expose the government's hypocrisy, in April the United States had entered World War I. 1914-18, in an effort to guarantee democracy abroad. Yet democracy did not exist at home where the entire female population remained disenfranchised. In June police began arresting demonstrators on minor charges, such as obstructing traffic. But the arrests did nothing to deter the suffragists. Upon their release from prison, they returned to protest at the White House gates. In all, 168 women, including Alice Paul, 1885-1977, and Lucy Burns, 1879 to 1966, of the National Woman's Party, were arrested. On the night of November 14, 1917, guards took 33 protesters to the Occoquan workhouse to be held. 
Previously, the women had been subject to forced feedings and solitary confinement at Akakwan. But this time new cruelties awaited them. They were beaten, dragged, choked, and handcuffed. Word leaked out about the atrocities committed at the workhouse. Less than two weeks later, a judge ruled that the women had been brutally treated. Yet they had done nothing more than exercise their constitutional right to free speech. The women returned to their fight, now with more weight of public opinion behind them. Nevertheless, it was three long years before the 19th Amendment was adopted. Guaranteeing women the right to vote In 1982 a historical marker was placed on the prison grounds in Tribute to the brave women who endured Akakwan's Night of Terror What is Zionism? Zionism was founded as the nationalist movement to establish an independent Jewish state. It began in the 1890s, and roughly 50 years later, in 1948. The movement's activism resulted in the proclamation of the State of Israel. Since that time, Zionism has focused its efforts on building bridges between Israel and Jewish people around the world. The roots of Zionism date to 1882, when a movement began encouraging Jewish settlement of Palestine. The region in the Middle East, in Southwest Asia, that borders the Mediterranean Sea to the west. Lebanon to the north, Syria and Jordan to the east, and Egypt, the Sinai Peninsula. To the southwest. Groups advocating immigration to the Jewish homeland in Palestine called themselves lovers of Zion. Havavay Zion Mount Zion is the site in Jerusalem where the Temple of David, King of the Ancient Hebrews. D 962 BC, was built, and it is therefore considered the center of Jewish spiritual life. As a political movement Zionism was founded in the late 1890s by Austrian journalist Theodor Herzl, 1860 to 1904. In 1894, Herzl was among the reporters covering the trial of Alfred Dreyfus. A French army officer falsely convicted of treason. Though the artillery captain, who was Jewish, was later declared innocent. The guilty verdict rendered in his first trial was annulled. Many felt the Dreyfus case had exposed a deep vein of anti-Semitism in Europe. Herzl's conclusion was that if anti-Semitism could take hold in France, it could prevail anywhere. Based on this belief, he began working for the reclamation of a Jewish state in the Middle East. In 1897 Herzl convened the first Zionist Congress. Held in Basel, Switzerland, bringing the movement to worldwide attention. In 1917, against the backdrop of World War I, 1914-18, British Foreign Secretary Arthur James Balfour. 1848-1930, issued a declaration vowing his country's support for a national Jewish homeland in Palestine. This came after British troops liberated the Middle East from the control of the Ottoman Empire. In 1920 the Ottoman Empire dissolved as part of the conclusion of World War. In 
I and by international agreement the British were given rule over Palestine. Numerous Jews immigrated to Palestine, where fighting broke out with Arabs who opposed Jewish resettlement. Previously boosted by British support of an independent Jewish state. Zionists received a heavy blow in 1937 when, with another conflict in Europe on the horizon. Britain reversed its policy in Palestine in an effort to gain Arab support should fighting break out with Germany. At the end of World War II, 1939-45, Britain turned over the problem in the Middle East to the newly created United Nations, which decided that out of Palestine. Both an independent Jewish state and a self-ruling Arab state should be formed. In 1948 the State of Israel was declared by Polish-born and Zionist moderate David Ben-Gurion. 1886-1973, who became head of the nation's provisional government. The World Zionist Congress was later separated from the government. The organization has since turned its attention to immigration and cultural activities. German-born scientist Albert Einstein, 1897-1955, was among Zionism's most prominent adherents. What was the May 4th Movement? It was a mass movement that emerged in China after May 4, 1919, when students in Beijing protested one of the outcomes of the peace conference held at Versailles. Earlier that year to officially settle World War I, 1914-18 Japan, which had seized German territories in China during the war, was given control of the holdings. Student demonstrators criticized a weakened Chinese government for allowing the Japanese occupation. Following the death of powerful leader Yuan Shikai, 1859-1916. The country's central government crumbled, in northern China local military leaders, called warlords. Rose to power continually challenging the authority of the capital at Beijing. Meanwhile, revolutionary leader Sun Yat-sen 1866-1925, had begun promoting his three great principles nationalism, democracy, and people's livelihood in southern China. Where he gained the support of military leaders in the region. At about the same time, Chinese intellectuals had begun attacking traditional culture and society. Urging government reforms and the modernization of industry. The May 4th movement fanned the fires of revolution. The movement would have far-reaching and unforeseen results. And some might argue that the story has not yet played out. In 1919 Sun reorganized the Kuomintang, Nationalist, Party and began recruiting student followers. Two years later he became president of a self-proclaimed national government of the Southern Chinese Republic. Establishing the capital at Guangzhou, Canton. His sights were set on conquering northern China. Toppling the northern warlords to reunify the country. In 1924 Sun began cooperating with both the Soviets and the communist groups that had been formed by students following. The 1919 protest. Under Sun's leadership, the Nationalist Party began preparing for war. The 
but Sun, who is regarded as the father of modern China, would not live to see the culmination of his plans. He died of cancer in 1925. Under military leader Chiang Kai-shek, 1887-1975. The Kuomintang turned on its communist members, whose leaders fled in fear of the Generalissimo. In 1928, following a two-year military campaign, Chang led the nationalists to capture Beijing. Reuniting China under one government for the first time in 12 years. His rule of China lasted until 1949, when communists won control of the mainland and Mao Zedong. 1893 to 1976, became the first chairman of the People's Republic of China. The expelled Chang and his followers established a Chinese nationalist government on the island of Taiwan. Back on the mainland, Mao's great leap forward, his massive collectivization of agriculture and industry. Brought economic failure and a two-year famine to China in the late 1950s. What is the history of the Ku Klux Klan? The Ku Klux Klan, KKK, is a white supremacist group originally formed in 1865 in Pulaski, Tennessee. When Confederate Army veterans formed what they called a social club, the first leader, called the Grand Wizard, was Nathan Bedford Forrest, 1821-1877. A former general in the Confederate Army, who, on April 12, 1864, in the final days of the Civil War, led a massacre of 300 black soldiers in service of the Union Army at Fort Pillow, Tennessee. As the unofficial arm of resistance against Republican efforts to restore the nation and make full citizens of its black. Formerly slave, population, the Ku Klux Klan waged a campaign of terror against blacks in the South during Reconstruction. 1865-77, the 12-year period of rebuilding that followed the Civil War. Clan members, cloaked in robes and hoods to disguise their identity. Threatened, beat, and killed numerous blacks. While the group deprived its victims of their rights as citizens. Their intent was also to intimidate the entire black population and keep them out of politics. White people who supported the federal government's measures to extend rights to all black citizens also became the victims of the fearsome clan. Membership in the group grew quickly, and the Ku Klux Klan soon had a presence throughout the South. In 1871 the U.S. Congress passed the Force Bill, giving President Ulysses S. Grant, 1822-1885, authority to direct federal troops against the Klan. The action was successful, causing the group to disappear but only for a time. In 1915 the society was newly organized at Stone Mountain, Georgia. As a Protestant fraternal organization, called the Invisible Empire, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan Incorporated. This time widening its focus of persecution to include Roman Catholics, immigrants, and Jews, as well as blacks. Members of all of these groups became the target of KKK harassment. In 
which now included torture, whippings, and public lynchings. The group, which proclaimed its mission of racial purity, grew in number and became national. Electing its own to public office in many states, not just the South. But the society's acts of violence raised the public ire, and by the 1940s, America's attention focused on World War II, 1939-45, and the Klan died out or went completely underground. The group had another resurgence during the 1950s and into the early 1970s. As the nation struggled through the era of civil rights. The Klan still exists today, fostering the extremist views of its membership and staging marches to demonstrate its presence on the American landscape. Such demonstrations are often attended by protesters. What are reparations? Reparations are payments or other compensations made to a group of people who have been wronged or injured. The issue was in the news in the 1990s and early 2000s as lawmakers, academics, and other leaders pressed for a redress for slavery. Which some scholars call the American, or Black. Holocaust. The precedents for making reparations were several. The German government made reparations to survivors and families of victims of the Nazi Holocaust. And the American government made reparations to Japanese Americans who had been interned during World War II. 1939-45, as well as to Native Americans, for damages done to them. The recent discussion of reparations began in 1989, when U.S. Representative John Conyers, Michigan, introduced a bill, H.R. 40, in Congress to establish a commission to examine the institution of slavery and economic discrimination against African Americans and, if so determined, to make recommendations to the Congress on appropriate remedies. As the idea of reparations gained currency in the American public in the 1990s, supporters argued that redress for slavery would help heal the open wound of race relations and would compensate the descendants of slaves whose ancestors' work had helped build the national economy. They further argued that slavery resulted in long-term discrimination that beleaguered black Americans. They were the victims of a centuries-old government-sanctioned system that established a legacy of race-based injustices. African-American activist and author Randall Robinson explained it this way. No nation can enslave a group of people for hundreds of years, set them free bedraggled and penniless to pit them. Without assistance, in a hostile environment against privileged victimizers. And then reasonably expect the gap between the ears of the two groups to narrow. Lines begun parallel and left alone can never touch. In bolstering support for reparations, Robinson pointed to the consequences of this massive injustice that blacks in the United States experience high rates of infant mortality, low incomes, high rates of unemployment, substandard education, high death rates, below average lifespans, and overrepresentation in prisons and on death row.
Critics of reparations said that compensating the descendants of slaves was unrealistic. Determining who would be paid would alone constitute an expensive government program. They also questioned why descendants of slaves should be paid by the government a century and a half after the end of the brutal system. Further, they argued that other programs, born of the civil rights movement, have strived to bring equity to African Americans. Despite criticism, Rep. Conyers resolved to reintroduce his bill as often as necessary until Congress would act on it. He emphasized that his goal was to create a commission, informed by town hall meetings. To first determine if there should be reparations and if so, who should be paid and how much. H.R. 40 had received the support of the city councils of Detroit, Cleveland, Chicago, and Atlanta. Which you? S. State was the first to abolish slavery. Vermont was first, in 1777. On July 8 of that year Vermont adopted a state constitution that prohibited slavery. The first document in the United States to outlaw slavery, it read in part, no male person born in this country, or brought from overseas, ought to be holden by law, to serve any person, as a servant, slave or apprentice, after he arrives to the age of 21 years, nor female, in like manner. After she arrives to the age of 18 years, unless they are bound by their own consent. After they arrive to such age, or bound by law, for the payment of debts, damages, fines, costs, or the like. Vermont's constitution also gave suffrage to all men, regardless of race. Vermonters were the first to put a black legislator in the state house, Alexander Twilight. 1795 to 1857, was elected as a representative in 1836. Twilight also earned another first. In 1823 he graduated from Vermont's Middlebury College to become the first black person in the nation to earn a college degree. What was the nonviolent Indian reform movement? It was the movement led by Indian nationalist leader Mohandas Gandhi, 1869-1948, whose methods of protest included staging boycotts, fasting, conducting prayer vigils, and visiting troubled areas in an attempt to end conflicts. Gandhi, whom the people called Mahatma, meaning great souled, was determined to bring about change in India to bring an end to British control of the country, and to topple the ages-old caste system, the strict social structure, there. Gandhi believed that it took great courage to not engage in violence. And he began campaigns of passive resistance, which he called Satyagraha, meaning firmness in truth. Gaining a wide following, Gandhi's acts of civil disobedience did bring about changes in his homeland. Where he is revered as the founder of an independent India, 1947.
he remained faithful to his nonviolent beliefs throughout his life. He also adhered to a firm policy of religious tolerance. It was for this reason that the spiritual and nationalist leader was killed by a Hindu extremist in 1948. Who was Alice Paul? Alice Paul, 1885-1977, was a groundbreaking feminist before the word feminist came into fashion. The Mount Laurel, New Jersey, institute named in her honor describes her as the architect of some of the most outstanding political achievements on behalf of women in the 20th century. Paul was born in 1885 to Quaker parents who instilled in her a belief in gender equality. After completing high school the top in her class, Paul graduated from Swarthmore College in 1905 and began work toward an advanced degree. In 1906 she traveled to England, where she continued her studies did social work, and became actively involved in the suffrage movement. She was arrested three times for her involvement in protests. In 1916, when the American women's suffrage movement was divided and dead in the water, Paul founded the National Woman's Party, NWP, an organization that spearheaded the campaign for national women's suffrage and that continued working for women's rights and equality into the 21st century. Paul's leadership of the suffrage movement was critical in the passage of the 19th Amendment. 1920, which guaranteed women the right to vote. She organized thousands of activists to put enormous pressure on the White House and Congress. Paul employed what was then considered a most unladylike strategy of sustained, dramatic, nonviolent protest. The suffrage campaign was characterized by national speaking tours, marches, and pickets, including the first ever at the White House. When protesters were arrested, they sometimes endured brutal prison conditions and staged hunger strikes. After passage of the 19th Amendment, Paul continued her studies. Adding to her master's degree in social work, 1907, a doctorate in economics, 1912. She earned three more advanced degrees. Culminating in a Doctor of Law degree in 1927 from American University. Called a brilliant political strategist, the forward thinking Paul authored. The first Equal Rights Amendment for Women. Which she introduced to Congress in 1923. In 1942 she became chairperson of the National Woman's Party. She later added language of gender equality to the Charter for the United Nations as well as the 1964 Civil Rights Act. After a life of courageous activism on behalf of women, Paul died in 1977. Who was Alice Paul? Alice Paul, 1885-1977, was a groundbreaking feminist before the word feminist came into fashion. The Mount Laurel, New Jersey, institute named in her honor describes her as the architect of 
some of the most outstanding political achievements on behalf of women in the 20th century. Paul was born in 1885 to Quaker parents who instilled in her a belief in gender equality. After completing high school the top in her class. Paul graduated from Swarthmore College in 1905 and began work toward an advanced degree. In 1906 she traveled to England, where she continued her studies. Did social work, and became actively involved in the suffrage movement. She was arrested three times for her involvement in protests. In 1916, when the American women's suffrage movement was divided and dead in the water, Paul founded the National Women's Party, NWP, an organization that spearheaded the campaign for national women's suffrage and that continued working for women's rights and equality into the 21st century. Paul's leadership of the suffrage movement was critical in the passage of the 19th Amendment. 1920, which guaranteed women the right to vote. She organized thousands of activists to put enormous pressure on the White House and Congress. Paul employed what was then considered a most unladylike strategy of sustained. Dramatic nonviolent protest. The suffrage campaign was characterized by national speaking tours, marches, and pickets, including the first ever at the White House. When protesters were arrested, they sometimes endured brutal prison conditions and staged hunger strikes. After passage of the 19th Amendment, Paul continued her studies. Adding to her master's degree in social work, 1907, a doctorate in economics, 1912. She earned three more advanced degrees. Culminating in a doctor of law degree in 1927 from American University. Called a brilliant political strategist, the forward-thinking Paul authored. The first Equal Rights Amendment for Women, which she introduced to Congress in 1923. In 1942 she became chairperson of the National Women's Party. She later added language of gender equality to the Charter for the United Nations as well as the 1964 Civil Rights Act. After a life of courageous activism on behalf of women, Paul died in 1977. Who was Emmeline Pankhurst? Pankhurst 1858-1928, a key figure in the women's suffrage movement, was a militant reformer who waged a decades-long battle to win the vote for women in Great Britain. Pankhurst's sometimes radical campaign greatly influenced her American counterparts. Though she held various municipal offices and was married to an influential barrister, Richard Marsden Pankhurst, she worked for change primarily through the organizations she founded. In 1889 she organized the Women's Franchise League. And five years later the group's work secured the right of all women, married and unmarried, to vote in local elections. She went on to found the Women's Social and Political. Union in 1903. The union was known for its extreme tactics. In 
the British suffragist movement culminated in 1928 with the passage of the Representation of the People Act, which gave all women the right to vote in elections. Hank Hurst died later that year. Who was Emmeline Pankhurst? Pankhurst, 1858-1928, a key figure in the women's suffrage movement, was a militant reformer who waged a decades-long battle to win the vote for women in Great Britain. Pankhurst's sometimes radical campaign greatly influenced her American counterparts. Though she held various municipal offices and was married to an influential barrister, Richard Marsden Pankhurst, she worked for change primarily through the organizations she founded. In 1889 she organized the Women's Franchise League. And five years later the group's work secured the right of all women, married and unmarried, to vote in local elections. She went on to found the Women's Social and Political Union in 1903. The Union was known for its extreme tactics. The British suffragist movement culminated in 1928 with the passage of the Representation of the People Act which gave all women the right to vote in elections. Pankhurst died later that year. Have all nations of the world granted women the right to vote? No. In a few nations women remain disenfranchised. By the 1990s women had a legal right to vote everywhere in the world except in six Middle Eastern countries. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar. And United Arab Emirates, as well as in Brunei, a small oil-rich country in Southeast Asia. In 2001 Bahrain extended equal voting rights to women, and in 2003 Qatar did the same. But a traditional interpretation of Islamic law kept Muslim women from voting in a few conservative Persian Gulf states. Kuwaiti lawmakers proposed limited women's suffrage in spring 2005, but the measure was not approved. There was mounting pressure, from inside and outside the Muslim world, for this to change. The issue was an important focal point for the Human Rights Watch, an international watchdog group. In October 2004 a high-ranking Egyptian cleric spoke out on the contentious issue, saying, it is the right of a Muslim woman to vote for and speak her opinion about whoever serves public or greater interests. He went on to clarify that he was talking about Muslim women in all Muslim countries. In Egypt, Kuwait, and others. Suffrage for women has been one country by country and decade by decade. Further, Within many countries, rights have been extended only gradually. For example, beginning with local elections. The first nations to extend broad voting rights to women were New Zealand in 1893, Australia, and South Wales in 1902, and Finland in 1906. In the 1910s women in several European and Scandinavian nations, including Austria, Denmark, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, 
Norway, Poland, and Russia, won the right to vote largely as a result of World War I, 1914-18. The 1920s added not only the United States and the United Kingdom, to a voting status equal to men. But about a dozen other nations, including the former Czechoslovakia and Sweden. Every decade since added more nations to the tally. So that as of 2004 only a few nations denied women the right to vote. Have all nations of the world granted women the right to vote? No, in a few nations women remain disenfranchised. By the 1990s women had a legal right to vote everywhere in the world except in six Middle Eastern countries. Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Oman, Qatar, and United Arab Emirates, as well as in Brunei, a small oil-rich country in Southeast Asia. In 2001 Bahrain extended equal voting rights to women, and in 2003 Qatar did the same. But a traditional interpretation of Islamic law kept Muslim. Women from voting in a few conservative Persian Gulf states. Kuwaiti lawmakers proposed limited women's suffrage in spring 2005, but the measure was not approved. There was mounting pressure, from inside and outside the Muslim world, for this to change. The issue was an important focal point for the Human Rights Watch, an international watchdog group. In October 2004 a high-ranking Egyptian cleric spoke out on the contentious issue, saying It is the right of a Muslim woman to vote for and speak her opinion about whoever serves public or greater interests. He went on to clarify that he was talking about Muslim women in all Muslim countries. In Egypt, Kuwait, and others. Suffrage for women has been one country by country and decade by decade. Further, within many countries, rights have been extended only gradually. For example, beginning with local elections. The first nations to extend broad voting rights to women were New Zealand in 1893, Australia and South Wales in 1902, and Finland in 1906. In the 1910s women in several European and Scandinavian nations, including Austria, Denmark, Germany, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Norway, Poland, and Russia, won the right to vote largely as a result of World War I, 1914-18. The 1920s added not only the United States and the United Kingdom, to a voting status equal to men. But about a dozen other nations, including the former Czechoslovakia and Sweden. Every decade since added more nations to the tally. So that as of 2004 only a few nations denied women the right to vote. 